Hello and welcome. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the freshwater snails of Missouri. Uh, my name is Sam Doherty. I work for the Missouri Stream Team at um, the Missouri Department of Conservation. Uh, and we at Stream Team just thought it would be nice to put together a little uh, educational presentation uh, for the Show Me Snails project uh, so that any of the volunteers and staff who helped out with that project would have the opportunity to kind of learn about the animals that they were collecting for that study. Uh, so first of all, what are snails? Uh, so snails are considered mollusks. They're in that phylum mollusca. Uh, that is a very large grouping of invertebrate animals. Uh, so for comparison, uh, all vertebrates are in their own phylum, chordata. Uh, so you can imagine just how uh, large and diverse uh, that grouping of the, the mollusks are. Uh, and within that phylum, uh, snails would be in a certain class, uh, gastropods, uh, the gastropoda. Uh, the word snail uh, is just kind of a generic term. It doesn't really have any taxonomical weight to it. Uh, it's really applied to all kinds of different gastropods uh, that possess a shell. Uh, when I say gastropod, uh, that word kind of comes from uh, belly foot or creature that uh, walks on its stomach. Uh, just kind of referring to snails uh, and how they, uh, they move around. And we'll talk about that. All right, so mollusks. Uh, mollusca is actually the second most diverse group of animals uh, after the arthropods, so insects and arachnids, uh, things like that. Uh, very, very diverse, uh, very species rich. Uh, estimates for just how many species of mollusks there are uh, vary pretty widely from the tens of thousands to a few hundreds of thousands. Uh, and there's still quite a few species being described uh, every year, mostly marine species. Uh, but all mollusks have a few things in common. Uh, one of the most signature characteristics uh, is the presence of a shell. So a hard calcium carbonate shell uh, that either wholly or partially encloses their, their mantle, the, the soft part of their body. Uh, obviously, as you can see in the lower picture, uh, some of these mollusk species have lost that shell uh, secondarily. So things like slugs uh, have done away with their shell. Uh, most of the cephalopods, uh, so squids, octopi, uh, they've either internalized that shell or gotten rid of it entirely as well. Uh, so if you've ever heard of a cuttlefish bone, uh, that bone is actually the internalized shell uh, of the cuttlefish, which provides structure for it. Uh, so again, uh, mollusks, mollusks are really, really variable. A lot of diversity in, in shape, uh, function, niches. Uh, there are seven different classes of them, but there are three main ones that are very diverse and well-known. Uh, the first is the cephalopods. Uh, the head foots, uh, so things like squids, octopi, nautilus, cuttlefish, uh, and out of those, only the nautilus uh, still possesses an external shell. Uh, you saw that on the previous slide. Uh, the bivalves, uh, so mollusks that have a shell in two parts connected by a hinge, uh, so mussels, clams, oysters, things like that. And then finally, the gastropods, uh, the stomach foots, uh, snails and slugs, uh, sea snails, what we're going to be talking about. Uh, and then there's some other lesser known groups uh, that are all marine uh, and they're not as diverse uh, or well studied. Uh, so here's just a picture of different mollusks and their shells. Uh, most of the top left would be different bivalves, uh, clams, uh, mussels. Uh, the lower right is just a couple cephalopods there. Nautilus, uh, cuttlefish, uh, and pretty much everything else, especially in the center, uh, that's all the gastropods, so all the different uh, snails and whelks, conchs, uh, things like that. Uh, so those gastropods, uh, those are actually the most diverse group of the mollusks. Uh, they account for about four-fifths of the overall species diversity. Again, uh, things like snails, slugs, uh, sea slugs, abalone, uh, species like that. Uh, they're actually second uh, in total number of species uh, only to insects. So insects are the most species diverse group of animals. Uh, and then the gastropods would be second 
Uh, and unlike the other mollusks, they occur in uh, pretty much every, most environments you can think of, uh, not just marine, but also freshwater and uh, most terrestrial habitats as well. So the freshwater snails, what we're going to be talking about specifically today, uh, they are most diverse in North America, uh, particularly the southeastern United States, it seems to have the most diversity. Uh, and you can kind of break them into two major groupings. Uh, you have the gilled snails, which have gills. They are getting their oxygen directly from the water, much like a fish. Uh, and then the lunged snails. Uh, so these are aquatic snails, but they possess a lung, uh, and most of them are getting their air, their oxygen from the surface. Uh, taxonomically, they're a little messy. Uh, they're messier than they even used to be. Uh, so they don't break down quite that easily, uh, but breaking them into those two major groupings uh, is still pretty useful uh, to, to break down and understand the uh, snail lineages that we have. So basic snail anatomy, uh, obviously the most conspicuous part of a snail is its shell. Uh, and that's actually where most of its organs are. So under that shell, they have their mantle which is kind of just their basic body wall. Uh, and then beneath that layer uh, is all their viscera, all their organs. Uh, so their gills, uh, the digestive tract, uh, lungs, heart, uh, reproductive organs, all of that is protected uh, within the shell. Uh, and then of course, uh, they have the foot, which kind of looks like their body or their belly. Uh, that's where they get the name gastropod. Uh, that's really just a, a locomotive uh, organ for locomotion. Uh, that's what they're using to move around. Uh, it's mostly muscular. There's really not a whole lot of viscera associated with that. Uh, it's very similar to the foot that uh, uh, bivalves have, like mussels. Uh, it's like uh, river mussels. Uh, they'll use their foot to bury themselves deeper in the substrate or kind of move around a bit. Uh, it's, it's really the same, same sort of structure. Uh, they do have a distinct head region uh, with a mouth uh, they do have eyes, but unlike uh, some of the terrestrial snails you might be familiar with, uh, their eyes are actually at the base of their tentacles uh, instead of the tips. So most of our terrestrial snails have eye stalks. They've got little eye spots at the end of those tentacles. Uh, but with our freshwater snails, uh, their eyes are just kind of uh, on their head uh, at the base of those tentacles. Uh, the tentacles themselves, they're kind of used for chemoreception, so a sort of sense of smell. Uh, they're picking up different odors, uh, chemical signatures in the water and on the substrate. Uh, and our freshwater snails, they only actually have two, uh, two of those. Uh, so they have one pair of tentacles, whereas uh, most of our land snails, they actually have two pairs of tentacles. Uh, so again, most of their organs are within that, uh, within the shell in their body cavity. Uh, they also have what's called an open circulatory system. So unlike vertebrates, which have blood vessels, uh, their blood is just kind of all over their entire body cavity. Their whole body cavity is filled with blood. The blood is not restricted to any arteries or veins. Uh, so their organs are just kind of constantly uh, in a bath of their own blood or their hemolymph, as it's often called. Uh, this is a, kind of a trait that they share with the arthropods as well. So things like insects uh, and arachnids, uh, they don't have a closed circulatory system. Uh, their blood is also kind of different uh, in its composition. So whereas uh, us vertebrates, we generally have uh, hemoglobin. So the oxygen binding compound in our blood is iron based, uh, which makes it a red color. Uh, most of these snails, uh, have in a copper-based blood uh, compound in it. It's called, hemo, or it's called hemocyanin. Uh, and that copper that actually gives it kind of a greenish or bluish color. Uh, here's just kind of a view from the uh, underside of a snail. So most of that, what's visible is just the foot, that muscular organ. Uh, you can kind of see its mouth and its tentacles. Uh, so the foot, again, uh, that's the main way snails are using to get around. Uh, that's kind of their feet. Uh, that's what they're using to travel and stick to things. Uh, they kind of use it in two different ways. 
Uh, so one, they can just kind of contract and undulate the muscles within that foot uh, to kind of creep around and move their body. Uh, but then the underside of that foot is also covered in tiny microscopic hairs or cilia, as they're called. Uh, and they can kind of use those as well, um, moving those independently to gain a little more traction and to just uh, very slowly glide across surfaces. Uh, obviously, as snails, they are producing a lot of mucus from that foot. Uh, the main reason for that is kind of to provide a smooth surface so their foot can contract uh, without getting a lot of abrasion or friction from the substrate. Uh, so it's kind of a smooth, uh, easy, easy lubricant uh, for their movement. Uh, it can also help them uh, seal to different uh, substrates or objects uh, so they can stick to rocks or uh, fallen limbs or uh, glass terrariums. So you can see in this picture, uh, there's just another picture of the foot. You see, it's it's mostly muscles. Uh, it's contracting quite a bit in this picture. It's very flexible. Uh, here's just a video of a couple different kinds of snails uh, crawling around on the glass of a terrarium, they are using their mucus and the muscles of their foot to kind of form a seal on that glass, uh, and then they are using uh, flex flexion of their muscles as well as their little cilia uh, to kind of glide along, glide along the uh, glass surface. All right, uh, so shells. Obviously, the most conspicuous thing about a snail is their shells. Uh, those shells are made of calcium carbonate, as well as a bit of protein uh, that's very similar to bivalves, uh, so things like mussels. Uh, it's very similar makeup. Uh, their shell is actually connected to their mantle, so the snail's body uh, does get a blood supply. That's how it grows throughout the snail's life. So if you remove a snail from its shell, uh, you are actually killing the snail. You are severing uh, portions of its body. Uh, shell growth uh, is kind of inhibited by low pH. Uh, and this is true for really any shell forming animal. Uh, they like living in calcium rich waters. Uh, and when pH gets too low, they can't really utilize the calcium in that water to, to form their shells. So snails are actually pretty rare in really acidic waters, so things like bogs. Uh, they might have very little snail diversity or none at all. Uh, the outside of the snail shell, uh, it's covered by a layer called the periostracum. Uh, it's mostly protein. Uh, kind of give, gives the shell its uh, living color and pattern. Uh, it's the same with the um, mussels. Uh, and that, that tends to wear off over time, especially when the, when the shell is dead and empty. Uh, that kind of thin, colorful protein layer will flake off, and you're just left with the uh, bare white shell. And obviously, snails have shells for defense or protection. Uh, makes them a lot harder to eat, because any predator is going to have to either crack that shell or digest through it or manage to extract the snail. Uh, so they will retract into their shell whenever they are threatened. Uh, so here's just kind of a diagram showing the anatomy of a shell. Uh, so at the bottom is what's called the aperture. That is the opening of the shell. Uh, if you were measuring shell length, you would do that from the bottom of the aperture to the very top, to that pointed area called the apex. Uh, each coil of the shell is called a whorl. Uh, those indentations in between whorls are called sutures. Uh, this is just a diagram showing the different directions in which snail shells can coil. Uh, that causes some to have their aperture, their opening, on either the left side or the right side. That can be a useful uh, feature in IDing snails. Uh, only one family of snails in Missouri has their aperture on its left side. Uh, and we will talk about that in a bit. Uh, this is just a diagram showing some of the uh, variety of shell shapes. So 
range from very narrow and conical, uh, sometimes called turriform, and it looks like a little tower, uh, to very kind of wide, fat, uh, and ovate, uh, and pretty much everything in between. Uh, and even within a species, there is some variability uh, in shell features uh, between individuals and localities, uh, which has made taxonomy of snails pretty confusing because it's hard to tell if it's due to environmental factors or just a variation or actual different species. And of course, sometimes shells can weather, uh, which makes them a little harder to distinguish. Uh, this is just showing some of the uh, variation in, in the whorls and the indentations or the sutures on the shell, which can be a useful ID feature. But again, we're not really going to get into species ID, but uh, that is something you pursued. This is kind of be this would be what you would be looking for. One of those features is uh, are those in those sutures really deep, or are they kind of flat? Uh, are the whorls kind of uh, flat, shouldered, or are they more uh, indented and rounded? Uh, and of course, there are some snail groups that break the mold uh, in terms of shell shape. Uh, and we'll talk about these in a little more detail soon enough. Uh, here's just a couple of pictures uh, showing some of the uh, variety in shell shapes. Uh, there's at least five different kinds of snail here. So they can be pretty fat, uh, they can be pretty conical, or they can be shaped like a ram's horn. But, uh, so some snails, uh, specifically the gilled snail grouping, snails that have gills, uh, their shell possesses an extra feature called the operculum. Uh, it's, it's kind of like a little lid or a trap door that they have on their aperture, their shell opening. Uh, they can actually use that to completely seal up their shell uh, when they retract into it. Uh, it just gives them uh, much better protection from predators because the predator can't reach through that aperture and try and get at the snail. Uh, it can also help them survive uh, times of drought or environmental stress. If they can hide up in that shell uh, and protect themselves from the elements. Uh, generally, this operculum uh, is often not quite as hard or solid or rigid as the rest of the shell. It's a little more protein-based, so it has some flexibility uh, in many species. Uh, but again, only gilled snails have this, so it's a very useful uh, ID characteristic. And here's just kind of a diagram showing the positioning of the operculum uh, when the snail is active uh, versus when it's actually closed. It just kind of uh, sits behind the snail. And there's a picture. You can see the operculum is kind of halfway closed. So if that snail wanted to, he could pull it, uh, pull it in completely and cover uh, the rest of his foot. All right. So snails do have mouth, mouth parts. Uh, their main mouth part is what's called a radula. Uh, so the best comparison would be kind of a tongue that functions in a similar way. Uh, so all gastropods possess a radula. That's kind of a thing they have in common, although in some it's very specialized and uh, different looking. Uh, and it's very covered in these really small radular teeth these little microscopic teeth made of chitin. Uh, so it's used for rasping. Uh, it's a lot like a cat tongue if you've ever been licked by a cat. Uh, it's very, very rough and sharp. Uh, it's really the same concept. It's covered in those really tiny uh, scraping teeth. Uh, and that's what it's used for is to basically just uh, scrape off small food particles and pull it back into the mouth. So here's just kind of a close-up image of some of those radular teeth. Uh, they're microscopic. Uh, the number and shape of them varies uh, from species to species and uh, considering what the snail eats. Uh, so different snails with different diets, they have different kinds of radular teeth. Uh, snails that graze on algae often tend to have many, many really small radular teeth. But again, those are just used to scrape off little tiny food particles, uh, which are then pulled back into the mouth, uh, into the di digestive system. Here's actually a video of a snail uh, trying to 
preys on the uh, terrarium surface. So it's pulling its radula out of its mouth and it's trying to scrape the surface of the glass, uh, hoping to pull in any food particles that are stuck to it. All right, so now we're going to kind of talk about the uh, diversity of snails that we have in Missouri. Uh, we're going to basically break it down by family. Uh, we're not going to get to the genus or species level. Uh, so Missouri has at least 47 species of freshwater snail. Many of them aren't too well documented. It's, it's kind of unsure of uh, their total distributions. Uh, they're not that well studied uh, as a group of animals. Uh, but again, you can break them down into two different groups. Uh, the guild snails, or the prozobranchs, as they are called or were called, uh, they possess gills uh, and they possess that operculum structure as well that we talked about to close their shell. Uh, and then there are the lung snails or the pulmonate snails uh, which possess a lung. Uh, they mostly breathe air. Some of them can also breathe water as well. Uh, and their shells lack an operculum. So first, we're going to talk about the guild snails. Uh, so there are four families of guild snails in Missouri. Uh, there's about 24 species. Again, they possess gills and an operculum. Uh, the shell opening is always on the right side in all our families. Uh, within the state, they're most diverse in the Ozark region, uh, which is similar to a lot of the aquatic animals that we have in the state. So things like crayfish, uh, many fish as well, uh, they are most diverse in the Ozarks. Uh, there's a high degree of endemism in the Ozarks, so a lot of species are, are only found uh, in certain streams or drainages. Uh, a lot of mussels, too, are only found in certain streams and drainages. There's a lot of, lot of endemism, as it's called. All right, so the first guild snail family we're going to talk about is the Viviparidae. Uh, there's not really any good common names that apply to the families as a whole, uh, but some of the snails within this family are called Campylomas or mystery snails. Uh, we have five species in Missouri between three genera. Uh, there's one or two invasive species. These are the largest aquatic snails that we have in the state. Uh, they can get over an inch long. But the invasive one can actually get over two inches long. Uh, the best way to tell them apart from other snails, other guild snails, is by looking at their operculum, because they actually have just concentric circles. Uh, that's the pattern that they have on their operculum. Uh, the other guild snails, it's more of a spiraled pattern. Uh, they get the name viviparid, actually uh, because of the, the way that they reproduce. Uh, so viviparous actually refers to live birth. So these snails do give live birth, but they are what's called ovoviviparous, uh, which means they produce eggs, uh, but they retain those eggs within their body. Uh, and then those eggs hatch, and the live young are then uh, is excreted or pushed out of the female. Sounds weird, but there's actually a lot of animals that do that. Uh, many snakes, uh, some lizards, most sharks, uh, and some other fish as well, uh, employ that reproductive strategy of retaining eggs within their body. Uh, there's one species, uh, the pointed Campyloma, uh, that's actually capable of parthenogenesis. So that's where the females can reproduce asexually. Uh, they don't have to mate to produce fertile uh, embryos. Uh, it's a lot like aphids. Aphids do that as well. Uh, they kind of clone themselves. Uh, some lizards do also. Uh, these guys in Missouri usually find them in larger rivers, often kind of sandy bottoms. It's so not necessarily uh, shallow, rocky streams, but uh, slower sections of rivers or just larger rivers in general. Uh, some of them will actually bur bury themselves in the substrate or the sand. Uh, so here's just kind of showing the uh, different operculum patterns. Uh, so again, the viviparids, they have that concentric uh, pattern on their operculum, uh, whereas the other guild snail families, uh, it's more of a spiral pattern. Uh, but many of them are so small that you probably need uh, some sort of hand lens to really see that on some of the smaller families. Uh, it's just a pointed campyloma. Uh, most of our viviparids, they have that really kind of fat, almost obate, globular shell. Uh, it's not very, very conical. Uh, 
Uh, here's just kind of a comparison of two two of the genera that we have uh, in Missouri. They uh, look pretty similar, but uh, the point is just to show that uh, the way to tell them apart is mainly by looking at the aperture. So in Campyloma, the height of the aperture is greater than the width, uh, whereas in viviparous snails, uh, the height and width are more equal. All right, so the next family, the Hydrobiidae. Uh, again, they don't have any uh, common name for the family, but uh, many of them are called pebble snails or silt snails. Uh, they are really, really small, uh, generally less than a centimeter. Uh, they're also really diverse in Missouri. Uh, there's 13 species. Uh, it's hard to make a whole lot of generalizations about this family because they're pretty diverse uh, in shape uh, and function. Uh, there is one species that's actually thought to be extinct. Uh, used to live in the White River drainage. Uh, this is the same species as the picture before, just from a different angle. Uh, so some of them have really round uh, ovate shells like this, but then other hydrobeids are, are a lot more conical. Uh, we do, however, have some interesting uh, cave-dwelling uh, snails, uh, and all of our cave snails belong to this hydrobead family. Uh, between three genera. Uh, one of the genera you can see here uh, is called Funtigens. Uh, just really, really tiny snails that live in uh, cave streams, uh, mostly kind of rocky cave streams. Uh, mostly what they're doing is they're just kind of scraping uh, a biofilm off of these rocks, uh, just really kind of any bacteria buildup or organic matter uh, from any decaying material whatsoever, fungi, single-celled organisms uh, and they're often they're most common in uh, caves with lots of bat guano uh, that's pretty common so caves with lots of bat guano actually tend to have the greatest uh, diversity of life within them uh, just because the food chains within these caves uh, are, are kind of built uh, from these guano deposits so they kind of fuel the food chain uh, with the nutrients that the guano provides so a lot of the animals are either feeding uh, from the guano directly or they're feeding off of the fungi that feeds off of that guano. All right, the next family, the uh, Pleuroceridae, uh, that includes snails like uh, horn snails, rock snails, or alemias, as they're often called. Uh, we have four species in Missouri. Uh, some of those have very conical shells, but not all of them do. Uh, as far as size goes, they're kind of in between hydrobeids and viviparids, over a centimeter when they're adults. Uh, and they have a very small operculum compared to the other gilt snails. Uh, it's very dainty looking and it doesn't, doesn't quite uh, cover all of their aperture in the same way that it does in the other families. Uh, they're very, you really only find them in like uh, rocky flowing streams uh, in the Ozark region, uh, especially riffle habitats. So they like cold, clear, uh, fast-flowing water uh, with a hard, rocky substrate of cobble and gravel and boulders, uh, things like that. Uh, they're mostly feeding on algae on these rocks as well. Uh, so the picture on the right, you kind of see the arrows pointing to that uh, really tiny operculum. And that's one of the distinguishing features of this family is that really proportionally small operculum. And here's just some really, uh, really good photos from uh, Chris Lukop, different porosid snails. So they can be pretty beautiful if you have good enough lighting and a really high definition camera. All right, fourth guild snail family is the Pomadiopsidae. Uh, these ones you're not really likely to encounter in a stream because they are amphibious and they actually spend most of their time on land uh, usually in moist environments like stream banks or uh, semi-aquatic vegetation uh, we only have one genus Pomadiopsis in Missouri uh, with two different species I think there's only around four species or so in all of North America uh, so they're not very diverse they are all very very small uh, so again less than about a centimeter or so uh, but they all have very uh, conical or high spired shells which is called turriform so they all have that kind of shell shape <laughs>
Um, here's a few in the kind of habitat where you'd expect to find them, just uh, wet, muddy stream banks where they're going to be slowly crawling along and feeding on whatever algae or organic matter that they can get. All right, now we're going to talk about the lunged snails, pulmonates. Uh, so there are also four families of these snails in Missouri. Uh, most of them retain kind of an air pocket in their shell, so they will actually go to the surface uh, and kind of refill that with fresh air. Uh, so they're kind of using their shell like a diving bell uh, when they go underwater, uh, using that for their air supply. Uh, some of them can actually extract uh, water or oxygen from the water. Uh, they don't have an operculum, uh, so they are a little more vulnerable than the gilled snails. Uh, they're actually more closely related to terrestrial snails uh, than they are the gilled snails, interestingly enough. So uh, they share that characteristic of having a, uh, a lung. Right, the first family we're going to talk about is the Physidae, or the Physids. Uh, common names for these are Physa snails, pouch snails, uh, bladder snails. Uh, we have one to two genera or genus uh, in Missouri. Usually it's called Physa, sometimes uh, called Physella, or species are broken down into both. Uh, there's at least three species in Missouri. Uh, these guys have a reputation for having a lot of uh, shell variability uh, between different habitats and localities, so it's created a lot of taxonomical confusion. Uh, they're kind of medium-sized. Most of them are probably about uh, three-fourths of an inch or less. They're not quite as tiny as the uh, hydrobeids. Uh, and these guys, this is the family where the uh, shell opening is on the left side, as you can see in the bottom picture. Uh, and that sets them apart from all the other snail families that we have. So that is probably the best uh, distinguishing feature of this family. Uh, They're also kind of known to be generalists, uh, pretty much all facets of their life. Uh, they don't have a whole lot of preferences as to habitat. You can find them in almost any aquatic habitat. Uh, they will eat just about anything, any organic material that they can get, uh, whether it's just detritus or plants or dead animal material. Uh, they're also not very picky about water chemistry or water quality. So there's a couple pictures of different sizes. Uh, the two most common species we have are the, what's known as the tadpole physa uh, and the acute bladder snail, uh, the latter of which is, was sometimes called the uh, European physa. Uh, it was actually first described in Europe and was thought to be uh, an indigenous European species, but uh, based on some genetic work, they think it was actually uh, an American species and was introduced to Europe uh, before it was described. Uh, most of them seem to have kind of this general golden color on their shell, uh, with little light speckles. Uh, so they're a rather attractive snail. The next family, uh, the Limnaids, uh, they look a lot like the Physes, except that their aperture is on the right side, uh, much like the Guild snails, uh, but they don't have an operculum. Uh, if, you're, if you're trying to ID a, a dead shell, uh, that's going to be pretty tricky because that operculum uh, often tends to fall off of uh, old dead shells. Uh, so just because you find an old old empty shell that doesn't have an operculum uh, doesn't mean that it didn't. Uh, so it's really best for, for trying to ID live snails. Uh, but again, uh, their aperture is on the right side, but they don't have an operculum. Uh, some of these species can get over one inch long or so. Uh, we have about six species in Missouri. Uh, they're often called pond snails. Uh, many species are associated with still water habitats like uh, ponds or wetlands, uh, things like that. Uh, there are some that will live in streams. Uh, they are more herbivorous uh, than other snails. They like eating uh, aquatic plants or long filamentous algae. Uh, there are some exceptions. Uh, they will occupy yeah, a couple other habitats as well, in addition to uh, ponds. So here's a few pictures. Again, you can see the uh, apertures on the right side. Uh, these snails, they have they tend to have really, really wide tentacles, wide, flat tentacles. Uh, 
You can kind of see that in the bottom picture. So that's another distinguishing feature if you can actually get them to uh, come out of their shell. Right. Next is the uh, Planorbidae, or the Planorbid or ram's horn snails. Uh, they get their name because their shell is coiled in a way that uh, looks a lot like a ram's horn. There's about 10 species in Missouri. Uh, these guys are often associated with uh, soft substrates, uh, so uh, either pool habitats within streams or still waters like ponds, uh, swamps, wetlands, things like that. So they really like uh, silty, soft substrate. Uh, and a lot of what they're eating is, is detritus uh, in that muck. Uh, they will eat other things as well, like aquatic plants. Uh, and interestingly, they are actually only snail with, with hemoglobin. Uh, it's not identical to the hemoglobin that we have, but um, the oxygen binding compound in their blood or their hemolymph uh, is actually iron-based as well, so it can give them kind of a reddish hue sometimes, at least in some species. So yeah, they're pretty distinctive, uh, easy to tell apart from other aquatic snails. You can find them in lots of different habitats, but they usually prefer uh, still or slack waters and uh, soft substrates. Uh, finally, we're going to talk about the uh, ensilid snails. Uh, sometimes they're lumped into the same family as Planorbidae. Uh, we're just going to treat them as their, their own family for simplicity. Uh, sometimes they're called freshwater limpets. Uh, there's actually a couple, th couple different animals called limpets. Uh, it's a fairly accurate description, though. Uh, they're almost flat, much more flattened than any of the other snails. Uh, they kind of look like half a mussel shell, actually. Uh, they're very, very small, uh, usually only a couple millimeters. Uh, we have about three species described in Missouri. Uh, mostly what these guys are doing, they're kind of clinging to rocks, uh, usually in riffle habitats, in uh, kind of clear flowing streams, uh, and feeding on the algae. Uh, these guys actually lack an air cavity, so they don't go to the surface to replenish their air supply. Uh, they just absorb oxygen, uh, from projections on their foot, uh, and probably they're absorbing some oxygen uh, through most of their body just by living in a highly oxygen-saturated environment. Uh, so if you think of riffles, uh, there's a lot of turbulence, the water's breaking over the rocks, uh, it's forcing a lot of atmosphere, uh, atmospheric oxygen into the water, uh, so the water is hypersaturated with O2. And that's where these guys like to live. There's a couple different angles. I see the top left is looking at it from the bottom. Uh, you can kind of make out the foot, uh, head, and tentacles uh, of that snail. Uh, top right, you can kind of see them, how they look like from the side. Uh, again, they kind of look like uh, half of a muscle shell almost, but really, really tiny. Uh, to get a good picture of the size, uh, the picture on the bottom right, uh, you can see one of these uh, freshwater limpet snails on a much larger uh, snail shell. So yeah, again, they're only a couple millimeters. And that's what they would kind of look like in their natural habitat, just uh, stuck to rocks and riffles. Uh, they look very similar to uh, water pennies, which are a aquatic insect that have a very similar uh, shape and feeding strategy. So they're very flattened and they just stick to uh, rocks and riffles uh, and they, they graze algae as well. So it's a, Pretty, pretty common strategy in riffles. All right, so now we're gonna kind of change gears, talk about uh, basic life history and ecology of our freshwater snails. Uh, so in Missouri, you can find snails in pretty much any aquatic habitat. Uh, you can find them in ponds or wetlands, uh, rivers, reservoirs. Uh, you can find them in streams. Uh, but obviously different species have different uh, habitat preferences. Uh, things like the porosid snails, uh, you really only find them in uh, flowing rocky streams. A lot of the viviparids, they like uh, slower moving rivers, uh, deeper waters or finer substrates. Uh, a lot of the pulmonate snails like planorbids and limnaids, uh, they like kind of really warm 
uh, still stagnant water with lots of organic material, uh, lots of aquatic plants, uh, things like that. Uh, and then, of course, you have generalists like the physids, which you can find pretty much anywhere there's water. Uh, and then we have those troglodytic species, those species that live uh, within cave streams and cave systems. So here's just kind of an example of uh, what you'd see in a riffle or what a riffle habitat would look like. Uh, just very rocky, very clear water. Uh, kind of snails that you'd expect to find here would be like parasids uh, and silids. Just cling to these rock surfaces, feeding on algae. Uh, probably would find physids as well, just because they're everywhere. I uh, might find some limnaids. This is kind of a picture of, of a pool habitat in a stream, so an area of uh, lower flow. Uh, it's not as much uh, velocity. Uh, it's deeper water. You get more accumulations of finer sediment, uh, like sand or mud. Uh, you might get a lot more organic uh, material falling out and being deposited. Uh, so you can find probably a mixture of different gilled and lunged snails here. Uh, you might find some viviparids uh, kind of bur bur burying themselves in the sand. Uh, you might find some physids. Uh, you might find some planorbids as well uh, on any kind of uh, accumulations of detritus. That's kind of an example of a marsh or pond habitat, lots of aquatic vegetation, uh, soft muddy bottom. You can see it's covered in little tiny snails. Uh, so that soft bottom, it's got a lot of uh, organic material uh, that those snails would be feeding on. Uh, you'd also expect to find the snails uh, crawling up the plants uh, feeding on the algae that grows on those plants and feeding on the plants themselves. And these kinds of habitats you'd expect to find a lot of ram's horn snails, those planorbids. Uh, you'd find a lot of the limnaid pond snails uh, and physids, as always, as well. All right, so kind of uh, different feeding strategies or the diets snails have. Uh, many of our snails would be considered grazers or scrapers, so they graze on algae uh, off the of firm surfaces, usually like rocks or sometimes woody debris uh, or even aquatic plants, depending on the snail and the habitat. Uh, it's a pretty common strategy for macroinvertebrates living in riffles, uh, just scraping the algae that grows off of those rocks. Uh, and those rocks provide uh, a nice, firm, stable surface for algae growth. Uh, so other snails can be considered bottom feeders or detritivores, uh, really feeding on any leftover organic material uh, in the system that gets deposited on the bottom, and they're helping break that down. Uh, so detritus could be anything from uh, decaying plant material, decaying animal material, uh, animal waste, uh, microorganisms, uh, really just all that gook uh, that you'd get at the bottom of a pool or a pond. Uh, these tend to be in, in soft substrates in those still waters uh, where all of this organic material falls out of the water column uh, and then is deposited on the bottom uh, for snails and other detritivores to feed on. Uh, other snails, uh, they will eat aquatic plants, so things like limnaids uh, often feed on aquatic plants. Uh, some physids and ram's horns will eat aquatic plants as well. Uh, there's a few that can actually filter feed using their cilia. Uh, there's really only the viviparids uh, that can do that. So as far as how that, what they, they really do in these ecosystems, this kind of services they provide, the functions they perform. Uh, so the grazing snails, they obviously they're reducing the algal density uh, on these substrates. Uh, so anyone who's ever had a aquatic aquarium uh, with fish, uh, they have an algae problem. You know, one of the main ways to remedy that is to get snails to kind of graze on that algae continuously, keep it from building up. Uh, so that's one of the functions that they have in different ecosystems, uh, just kind of reducing the overall algae growth, uh, al reducing the algae cover on the substrate. Uh, and by grazing, they can actually stimulate some new growth uh, for other uh, macroinvertebrates to then graze on. There's a lot of algae grazers in these ecosystems. 
Uh, and of course, by grazing, they're also helping to influence the, the algae structure uh, and the species diversity of algae uh, on those substrates. And they can also clean off aquatic plants of algae, which uh, helps those aquatic plants uh, be more productive. Uh, and then the detritivores, uh, obviously their, their function is to kind of recycle that uh, leftover waste, that organic material, uh, back into the food web by incorporating it uh, and turning it into their own living tissues, uh, which they can then pass that energy and uh, nutrients on up the food chain to other animals. So snails as prey. Uh, snails do have predators, uh, but generally they're not preferred prey just because their shell gives them a little more protection. Uh, so if you're living in, say, a stream bottom, uh, and you're looking for aquatic macroinvertebrates to eat, uh, it's a lot easier to just eat things like midge, midge larvae, uh, black fly larvae, mayfly nymphs, uh, just because they don't have that protection that the shell gives them. Uh, but many animals will still eat them opportunistically, uh, but there's not too many snail specialists, uh, not too many animals that uh, prefer eating snails. Some of the animals that do eat them, uh, different fish, uh, some fish can actually will eat them and then pass them through their digestive system and the snail will still be alive. Uh, some aquatic insects will eat snails, like the dragonfly nymphs, uh, giant water bugs. Crayfish can actually be pretty important predators for snails, uh, as can some leeches. Uh, so leeches will actually suck out the juices of snails uh, and other uh, aquatic invertebrates. They don't just feed on vertebrates. Uh, turtles and amphibians will eat them as well. Uh, as can some waterfowl like coots or ducks. Uh, and then snails also have some terrestrial predators. So there are some beetles that specialize in feeding on snails. Uh, there are some small snakes like brown snakes, uh, thrushes, uh, water thrushes, which are different songbirds. Uh, they will feed on snails. Probably not feeding on aquatic snails to any great extent, but uh, they probably would given the opportunity. So again, crayfish are pretty important predators. Uh, they're usually uh, attacking either snails that are small enough for them to crush the shell, uh, or just snails that have very thin, weak shells that they can kind of uh, chip away or tear apart. Uh, and the lung snails, they tend to have uh, weaker, thinner shells, so like the physid snails. Uh, their shells are not as strong as many of the guild snails. Uh, so they are actually, they tend to be preferred prey uh, for crayfish, at least when they have a choice, uh, they'll go after those physid snails. Uh, when snails are attacked by a predator like crayfish, uh, they will do different things in response. Uh, so the gilled snails, because they have that operculum and that stronger shell, uh, they'll usually just close that operculum uh, to protect themselves and really rely on their shell uh, to defend them from predators. Uh, whereas some of those lung snails, like planorbids and physids, uh, they will actually retreat to the surface uh, to get away from predators like crayfish. Uh, tadpole physes, again, they have a lot of variability in their shell. Uh, some experiments have found that uh, when physid snails are grown around crayfish, uh, they will actually grow a smaller aperture on their shell, which makes it harder for the crayfish to get them. So some fish will prey on snails as well. Uh, in Missouri, we, we have the uh, red ear sunfish, which lives in southern Missouri. It actually is kind of a snail specialist. Uh, it uses its uh, pharyngeal teeth or its throat teeth uh, to crack and crush the shells of snails so it can eat them. Uh, darters will sometimes feed on small snails or extract them from the shell. Uh, the Tennessee snail darter, which does not occur in Missouri, uh, is actually a snail specialist. Uh, some of our other darters will at least feed on snails in captivity. Uh, the extent to which they do this in the wild uh, is not really well known. Uh, it's probably easier for them to just feed on aquatic insects than bother with a snail, uh, but it probably does happen. Uh, so turtles, uh, things like the northern map turtle, uh, which live in rocky Ozark streams. Uh, the females, they have uh, disproportionately large heads uh, and jaws compared to the males. I just thought they're using that to crush uh, the shells of uh, things like river mussels, uh, snails, and crayfish. Then uh, this one is not a Missouri species, but the, if anyone's ever heard of the uh, snail kite, 
uh, which occurs in the Everglades of Florida. Uh, it is actually a snail specialist. Uh, almost their entire diet uh, is those big apple snails. So snails are often actually intermediate hosts for uh, different parasites. Uh, often they're intermediate hosts for different um, flatworms or trematodes. Uh, sometimes they're called flukes. Uh, one in particular is a common liver fluke uh, that uh, parasitizes the uh, American ribbed fluke snail, uh, which is an American species that's been uh, introduced all over the world. Uh, how most of these uh, flatworms life cycles work is that the aquatic snail uh, ingests the fluke eggs. Uh, those eggs hatch inside the snail and they go through a couple different life stages. Uh, and then the snail uh, excretes those uh, flukes, uh, which then form a cyst uh, on aquatic vegetation. Uh, and then that aquatic vegetation and the cyst uh, is eaten by uh, often a large herbivore, things like a cows or sheep. Uh, sometimes they're eaten by humans. Uh, and then they will then uh, kind of complete their life cycle within that host, uh, living on and off of their host's internal organs. So they get the name liver fluke because the species often uh, feeds off of the host's liver. Uh, so they are a pretty, pretty bad uh, disease for some livestock around the world. Uh, some kinds of, of these flukes are, uh, they do parasitize, parasitize people at pretty high rates, uh, especially in tropical regions. Uh, not necessarily this species. Uh, in each species, they tend to have their own preferred snail host. Uh, the limnaid snails are pretty common uh, for hosts for flukes, actually. Uh, and it's when they get in people that they can cause some pretty nasty side effects. Uh, if you have them long term, they can they can be pretty pretty nasty. Uh, so. If you ever eat watercress or any uh, aquatic vegetation, make sure to wash it off pretty well or cook it. So as far as reproduction goes, uh, it kind of differs between the gilled snails and the lung snails. Uh, the gilled snails they actually have different, uh, uh, separate sexes. Uh, like most animals, they have males and females. Uh, pretty straightforward there. Uh, but the lung snails are actually all hermaphroditic. Uh, so each individual has male and female reproductive organs. Uh, so they can both uh, lay eggs and inseminate other snails. Uh, they can also self-fertilize. Uh, this is actually true for most land snails as well, which they are related to. Uh, so again, we talked about the uh, viviparid snails that give live birth. Most other snails, they actually lay eggs. Uh, most of them lay eggs in kind of large clutches, uh, often in spring. Uh, there are a few that just lay eggs individually, but most of them lay egg clutches. Uh, they kind of look like little tiny miniature versions uh, of amphibian eggs. Uh, if you've ever seen wood frog or salamander egg masses, uh, they look pretty similar. Uh, and they generally stick to surfaces like rocks or woody debris, uh, vegetation. On general, the lung snails uh, lay more eggs than gilled snails. Uh, that'll make a little more sense in a bit. Uh, they can lay up to a few hundred, uh, depending on the species. Uh, so it's just kind of a, a close pictures of those eggs, uh, with each yellow dot representing an uh, individual snail embryo. So in terms of their life history or their life cycle, uh, they don't really have any complex life stages. Uh, the hatchlings just look like miniature versions of the adults uh, compared to other mollusks like mussels, which have a whole complicated parasitic uh, glochidia, glochidia stage. Um, snails are pretty straightforward, uh, thankfully. Uh, uh, most lung snails, uh, they have pretty short lives. Uh, they generally don't live more than a year. Some of them can have multiple generations in a year. Uh, so that's kind of why it makes sense for them to lay more eggs, uh, just because they have fewer opportunities to reproduce, uh, because they have much shorter lives. Uh, 
They also have much thinner shells generally and no operculum, so that they might be at more uh, might have greater risk of being eaten by predators. So it makes sense for them to uh, both lay lots and lots of eggs, uh, for them to also be hermaphroditic, uh, so you can maximize the number of eggs uh, that a popula population produces because every individual uh, is potentially laying eggs. Uh, whereas the guild snails, they generally have longer lives, uh, so they can reproduce uh, multiple times in their life over the years, uh, so they generally don't lay as many eggs. And they have that strong shell to give them extra protection, so they don't have to worry as much about being eaten. So snails as indicator species of habitat or water quality. Uh, many of the guild snails would be considered what's uh, called somewhat pollution sensitive to facultative, just kind of right in the middle of pollution sensitivity. And that makes sense considering that they have gills. Uh, so if, you're, if you have a gill, you have to get your oxygen directly from the water, uh, and you kind of have to have your circulatory system in pretty close contact to the water as well, uh, which means whatever's in the water uh, is going to end up uh, in your body uh, pretty easily. Uh, it's true for fish and really any animal that has gills. Uh, so if there's a lot of pollutants and toxins in the water, uh, that's going to get incorporated into their tissues quite easily. Uh, they also tend to reproduce more slowly just because they don't have, they don't produce as many eggs. Uh, they're also poor dispersers uh, compared to the lung snails. Uh, many of the lung snails, they can colonize uh, different aquatic habitats so they can get to different ponds or wetland areas, places that might dry up periodically. Uh, they're better at getting around, uh, whereas the guild snails, they just, they can't really do that. Uh, so it, it's harder for them to kind of recolonize or repopulate an area uh, once that area gets disturbed uh, or polluted. Uh, so if you get uh, regular discharges of pollution, uh, it's hard for them to stay around. Uh, so you really only find them in, in healthier streams or intact uh, watersheds and cleaner water uh, just because they don't have... Uh, they can't reproduce at a fast enough pace uh, to compensate for any loss. So the lung snails are, again, they're generally more pollution tolerant, uh, more tolerant of disturbance. Uh, that kind of makes sense considering that they get, they generally get their oxygen from the air as opposed to the water. Uh, so they can live in water that has very little to no oxygen in it. Uh, again, their life history, their short life cycle, uh, the production of a lot of eggs being hermaphroditic, uh, that just makes them better colonizers uh, and better survivors in harsh, uh, marginal or disturbed habitats like polluted streams or ditches and things like that. Uh, so if you were to sample, say, an Ozark stream, uh, and you only find physid snails as opposed to any guild snails, uh, that could be some uh, indication of disturbance or poor water quality. All right, so there are some invasive snails uh, in the United States and in Missouri, uh, and some of our American snails are actually invasive or introduced uh, to other continents as well. Uh, so it, I think I said before, the, uh, the European Fiza uh, was a Fiza snail that was first described in Europe. Uh, so they actually thought it was European, but it was probably introduced uh, so long ago accidentally uh, from America. The American ribbed fluke snail, that uh, limnaid species, uh, it's also been introduced uh, to almost every continent. Uh, and that f uh, liver fluke has kind of been introduced along with it. Uh, so that's now in every continent as well. Uh, the picture here is showing a uh, sign in California trying to get people to uh, decontaminate anything that they put in the stream, uh, trying to stop the spread of uh, the New Zealand mud snails. So that's an invasive species uh, along much of the uh, West Coast, the Rocky Mountains, and the Great Lakes. Uh, it's actually from New Zealand, uh, which is interesting because uh, island species generally uh, don't become invasive. Usually islands are, are the problem, have uh, invasive species problems. So uh, this is the rare instance in which uh, an island species becomes invasive on the mainland. Uh, they're a pretty neat little snail. They're really, really tiny. Uh, and they can reproduce by parthenogenesis, so they can reproduce asexually uh, without mating. Uh, 
uh, and they can form really, really high uh, densities in these uh, areas that they're introduced to. So they can get uh, uh, close to a million snails uh, per square meter. Uh, and by reaching those really high densities, they, they can outcompete uh, the native snails and other native uh, aquatic macroinvertebrates. Uh, they've not been recorded in Missouri. Uh, that's not to say they couldn't couldn't in the future. Uh, say if they got into the Ozarks, they, they could uh, they could potentially wreak some damage. Uh, we do have at least one species of invasive aquatic snail in Missouri uh, called the Chinese mystery snail. Uh, is a, it's a viviparin snail, so it's one of those large uh, snails that give live birth. Uh, there's also the Japanese mystery snail, but I think there's some debate as to whether or not those represent two true species, but they're very, very similar. Uh, this is a really, really large snail. Uh, so if you see any really big aquatic snails in Missouri, it's probably this one. They can get over two inches, uh, which is significantly larger than any of our native species. Uh, but their shells generally aren't as thick either. Uh, they generally like slower waters uh, with soft bottoms like sand or mud. Uh, they are invasive in some other parts of the United States. So they've been in uh, the Great Lakes uh, and around New England for quite a while. I was thought that they were introduced uh, for uh, food. They're a pretty common food in East Asia uh, that they escaped or were intentionally released to be captured later. Uh, they're also kind of popular in the aquarium trade. And it's probably how they ended up in Missouri, just people uh, intentionally or accidentally dumping these snails into the environment. Uh, and they've been documented in the St. Louis region and the Kansas City region, uh, the Niangua River, and a couple other localities. <laughs> Uh, not really well studied in Missouri. It's kind of unknown uh, how well established they really are in our state or what effect they would really have or are having. Uh, there's been some research on them in other areas uh, like the Great Lakes, uh, trying to ascertain what effect they have. Uh, it's kind of mixed results. Uh, but they tend to be most common where there's a lot of human use. So things like boat docks, uh, some studies have found. Uh, which makes sense if that's how they're they're moving from place to place by attaching to uh, uh, different man-made objects like uh, boat boat holes and things like that. Uh, so we do have some snails that are in uh, trouble in terms of their conservation status. Uh, several dozen species in the United States are thought to have become extinct in the last few centuries. Uh, there's many hundreds that are likely endangered. Uh, many of those would be endemic species, so they only live uh, in one cave system or one stream system. Uh, and it's pretty common with small aquatic organisms. Uh, one of those is the Tumbling Creek Cave Snail, uh, which only lives in a Tumbling Creek Cave in streams within it. Uh, so it only lives in that one locality, uh, and it needs uh, clean, rocky substrate in those streams. Uh, so it's pretty sensitive to degradation and erosion within that uh, cave's watershed. Uh, there's been some sedimentation issues in the past that buried all of the rock, uh, and killed almost all of the snails. Uh, some of the most recent surveys for the snail have, have turned up uh, very, very few individuals. Uh, but, but anytime you live uh, in just one locality, uh, they're often, those species are often considered a species of conservation concern just because if anything happened to that one area, uh, they could potentially all go extinct. Uh, there's one species that is actually thought to be extinct in Missouri. Uh, that's the Ozark Perg. Uh, it's a hydrobead snail, one of those really tiny ones. Uh, it lived in the White River drainage uh, in kind of southwestern Missouri. Uh, and if you know anything about that river system, uh, it's been pretty heavily dammed. There's a lot of really big reservoirs on it, uh, and it's thought that those dams uh, inundated and kind of altered uh, the only habitat that this snail lived in to the extent where it could no longer survive. Uh, it hasn't been seen in decades, uh, so it is considered extinct. Uh, we do have uh, several other species of conservation concern in Missouri. Uh, so these are species that aren't necessarily considered endangered federally or in the state, uh, but they're species that are considered uh, rare or rapidly declining or just very endemic. So they only live in one area. Uh, most of them are the hydrobeids, those really small snails. And again, a lot of that 
uh, is from endemism. Uh, so they're only living in a few areas. Uh, so when the water quality declines in those areas, uh, they get in trouble. Uh, half the pleurocid species we have, those rock snails, are considered species of conservation concern, uh, some viviparids. Uh, but most of the snails that are species of conservation concern, as you can see, uh, are guild snails. Uh, only two snail species that we have on this list uh, are the lunged snails. One species of planorbid, uh, one species of limnaid are considered species of conservation concern. Uh, and you'd kind of expect that considering that uh, those lunged snails in general are just more tolerant of uh, poor quality habitats or uh, declining water quality. <laughs> All right, uh, that's all I have. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, big thank you to any of you who have helped out with the Show Me Snails project. Uh, be sure to check out our other videos on the YouTube channel or the uh, Stream Team program in general. Uh, thank you.